Hello, hello, welcome back to today's Baking a Mystery. Today's Baking a Mystery has been highly requested by one person, and I took that request to heart. I put it in my butt, I slept on it, and I was like, you know what, that feels good. I think I'm gonna do that one. So today, we are doing the South Korean movie called The Vanished. I think it's important to know that The Vanished was actually inspired and pretty much a remake, just in Korean, of the Spanish psychological thriller film called The Body. Now, speaking of the body, I want to talk about my body for a second because, well, okay, actually, let me give you a snippet of what today's story entails because I know, I know some of you guys are interested in stuff like this and I know some of you guys are going to be very scared of stuff like this, but essentially it takes place in a morgue where there is a woman who has recently passed away and before the autopsy can be performed on this woman, she disappears. Her body has been stolen from the morgue or has it been? It's a very confusing one. Lots of people end up dead, lots of people go to jail, and there's some major plot twist waiting to happen. But before, I want to talk about my body because listen, I have been making sure that my vanished booty comes back. I don't know what it is, but it's been vanishing more and more every single day. The situation of the vanishing booty. <laughs> These days, I've been doing a lot of glute-focused festivities, exercises, and all these fitness gurus that I watch on YouTube that are like, listen, if you want to grow your butt, you can't be scared of protein. And so now, I'm going to put you on something. Listen, if you have not tried built bars, you're going to thank me later because these are by far far my favorite guilt-free protein bar. They're packed with protein. They're low calorie, they're gluten-free, and honestly, I think they taste like real chocolate. So my favorite flavor right now, which I have been eating pretty much every single day of this week after I do some butt exercises, even when I don't do butt exercises, I throw this in my bag if I go anywhere. This is the cookies and cream one. Let me open this up for you because you need to see it to believe it. It's like a Snickers bar. It tastes like chocolate. It tastes like dessert, but it's protein. This entire bar is so filling. It's 130 calories for 17 grams of protein. And if you're like, listen, I would like cookies and cream. My other favorite flavor is double chocolate, 130 calories, 17 grams of protein. And if you guys are in like the protein space, you know that that's really low calories. Now here's the crazy thing. You're like, neither of those flavors are for me. They've got 18 delicious flavors. And I think I've tried like 14 of them and they're all so freaking good. And if you guys have already tried Built Bars before, they have new packs. Packaging. They have new taste. They added six more flavors. The new texture. Chef's kisses. Thank you, Built Bar, for sponsoring today's video and sponsoring my booty, honestly, because I'll send you pics when it grows. I'm kidding. They're all like, wait, don't, don't do that. <laughs> but if you guys are interested, I'm going to leave a link to all of the flavors of Built Bar and link to my description. Trust me, if you guys are trying to grow your butt, you need protein. And this has been the tastiest, low calorie version of protein that I have tried and true tested for you. A morgue, you say? So today's movie takes place at the morgue. Opening scene, we're at a morgue, and it's literally exactly what you expect from a morgue. The lights are flickering. The security guard is playing some old school Korean music. He looks like he's not into his job. It's quiet. You could hear a pin drop, and that is what we're thrust into in the middle or in the beginning of today's movie. So we're in the morgue. We're seeing all of these things. You see these drawers, like these steel drawers just filled with dead bodies and that's cool and they're all like zipped up in these like I want to say trash bags, like these bags, okay? Ziplog bags. <laughs> bags. And one of the names that stands out is a name by the name of Yoon's Huddy or something, but we're going to call her Veronica because Veronica is named in the video. Like, they call her Veronica, her English name. So today's video is about Veronica. And so she is the deceased person. Her name is on one of those drawers, and it's like a close-up. So you're like, okay, this person's going to be pertinent to the story. And then we go to the security guard, and he's just listening to music. And then, of course, all of a sudden, just as you would expect it, the security monitors, they blow out. They're gone. All of the security feeds that were on his computer, the guard's computer, finito, done, gone. And then the lights start flickering. So the security guard, of course, he has no choice. He's got to go do his job. He's got to guard the place. So he grabs his little flashlight and he starts walking down the halls of this morgue, shining his flashlight at different hallways, trying to figure out why is the electricity out? What's going on? And that's when he opens the door to the wall of steel containers and one of them is open and it's empty. A dead body's gone. 
So then he goes back into the hallway and he's trying to fix the electricity when we kind of see a glimpse of someone walking past him, okay? We don't necessarily exactly get to see who this person is or anything, but just like kind of a faint glimpse. And then he turns around and he's getting a little bit scared, but he still doesn't run away. I mean, the dude is dedicated. I would have been running at this point. And he's just looking around, still trying to fix stuff. He realizes that the generator is broken. And then all of a sudden, as he's walking around, the generator starts up again. And then he's like, okay, well, I guess I'll like go back to my desk. And as he's making his way back, he sees a glimpse of what seems to be a woman, just like in his peripheral vision. And then the lights turn off again. So then this is the point where he starts freaking out because he saw some shit, okay? He saw someone, so he's like, oh, hell no. That drawer was empty. There was a woman, I think. And so he starts running. He's trying to open the door to one of the offices and it's freaking locked. And then the camera pans from inside the office and we only get to see shadows through the window of the office. And we see him get bonked on the head by a hooded figure and he falls to the ground. And then we get our second scene, introducing to you motherfucking John. So this is a Korean man in a full suit and he's in front of a mirror and he, you know, I noticed that he was putting in his eye drops really peculiarly. So he's like doing one of those dramatic scenes where he's staring at himself in the mirror and then he puts eye drops in his eyes, but then he puts it in from this corner of his eyes and lets it fall like a tear onto his face. And I was like, that's really dramatic, dude. But then we realize exactly why he does that because he walks out into his living room where we get this really grim feeling of of obviously he just knew someone that passed and it's probably his wife because we get a lot of like wedding photos in his house and we've got all of these people that are all dressed in black that come up to him and they just say it's okay like just get some rest and one by one they leave the apartment there's a self-playing piano in the corner i mean the dudes is rich okay so we find out that his wife is the one who died and it's the empty drawer in the morgue so it's just like a weird shit show already happening then we're thrust into his porsche because they're like hey if you didn't already know by the by the way i looked it up because um i was curious and like a stein steinway piano that self-playing costs like 200 grand what a non-self-playing the bitches that you gotta play yourself are like a hundred grand but the ones that are like self-playing are like 160 grand Damn. And I was like, wow. So if like that didn't already tell you he was rich, we're going to be in his Porsche and he's going to be zooming down the streets of South Korea in his Porsche. Skr, skr. And I'm like, how are you skr, skr I've been to Korea. It's back to back traffic all day, all night. H how are you skr, skr But he's skr, skr through the roads of South Korea. And we're just like, whoa, okay, rich dude, calm your tits, okay? So he seems sad. Or is he? And then we get thrust back into the morgue. Now, all of these, we've got three police officers, one female, two males. They're all detectives i don't know their names they're not that pertinent to the story okay and so they're sitting there drinking coffee and they're just talking their captain they're talking their boss and so two of them are like you know what i don't even know how he's our captain he honestly sucks at his job how can he not even pick up his phone right now how can he be late right isn't he supposed to be on call right now and then one of them is saying listen he's actually a really good captain like he's he's pretty good and they're like no like i heard he used to be good until until that thing happened. I heard he used to be so good that he cracked one of the most unsolved cases in South Korea. He actually met the freaking president and the president of Korea gave him an award. But I bet you, I bet you he got to turn back in that award because he sucks at his job these days. And one of them is like defending the captain to the death. Like, no, our captain is a smart, intelligent. And then we hear skr skr outside and the captain pulls it and he reverses into a metal trash bin. And the dude's like, that's our captain. And he walks in, he looks drunk. He's, I mean, I can smell him through the screen, okay? He looks like a weird dude. And he's like, sorry guys, I, I didn't know my phone was ringing. It was, a bit, it was a bit day. He's like, catch me up on the case. So they're walking through the morgue and they're catching him up on the case. And they say, the security guard, I don't know. I feel like we should bring him to the hospital. He was the witness in the whole case. He said the electricity went out and he hit his head. He claims that he's been working here for four years and none of this stuff has really happened in this morgue before. It's a government owned morgue, so I don't know what the issue is. And uh, he thinks there was a break in. I'm not really sure. Now the whole time the captain, he's got this crazy hair. He honestly looks like the main character of old boy. Like that's how crazy he looks. And he's just drinking a juice, like a bagged juice while the police detectives are catching him up on the case that he's supposed to be working. And they're just like, yeah, but you know, they're, they're a little paranoid here at this morgue the security guards they said that they start developing anxiety even at night when like the phone rings they'll like 
themselves at the security desk, you know, because it's so scary. Like at a morgue, the phone rings in the middle of the night. You're bound to be scared. So he thought he saw a ghost or something. I don't know. Do you want to talk to him? And the captain looks at the detective and is like, the ghost? Um, n no, the, the security officer. <laughs> It seems like the captain's a bit of a troll. So the case goes something like this. There's no CCTV footage. It went out with the main generators. There wasn't any footage of there. If, if there actually was a break-in, they do know that there is a dead body missing and there is only one body missing. None of the other bodies were touched. And I mean, he saw a ghost. He alleges he saw a ghost. We don't really know. The doors were all locked, no windows were open, and no other like doors, windows, anywhere in the morgue are viable enough for an exit or an entry by a full-sized human. Like maybe a kid, maybe a dog, but definitely not a full-sized human. And it's, I mean, it's just weird. So then the captain's like, okay, well, who's the stolen body? Veronica, she's 45 years old. She's actually the daughter of a Tibor family. And what that means is like, um, in Korea, Tibor means like imagine Jeff Bezos's kids, but then in Korea it's a little bit different because like uh, I, 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 to my knowledge, the billionaires don't really pledge their money away. So like you know how Bill Gates is like, I'm only gonna keep a hundred million dollars for my family. Don't worry, I'm donating the rest to a charity. Which by the way, I'm not complaining about that. But then like in Korea it's a little bit different because it's like generational, so they just like keep the money in the family. I'm sure there's a lot of American families like that too, right? But we have a name for it. They're called Tibor, right? Like old money. Like old old money. So she is the daughter heiress of this old money family and she is now the CEO of Baron Pharmacy which was owned for generations it's one of the biggest pharmacies in South Korea allegedly and she is the CEO of that and she was dead and now her body has been taken her husband is by the name of John and he also works for the company. He was a professor before he became like a, I think he does both. So he's like a part-time professor, part-time works for Baron Pharmacy. He He's really smart allegedly. So he does a lot of research in pharmaceuticals. Um, he's really sad. They're kind of like a power couple. So their wedding was like the royal wedding of South Korea. Everybody knew about it. It was like the biggest thing ever. They're like an elite family. He came from a pretty well off family too. So they just like married into just like, money it was just a money everywhere you know one of those situations and the captain's like i know exactly what you're talking about and he's like yeah well i mean she died of a heart attack we haven't been able to do an autopsy until the body was taken so i mean that's kind of what it is she was 45 had a heart attack so the captain's like well i want you to bring in the husband to the morgue and we gotta let him know what happened so they're like you want us to call the husband john yeah get him into the morgue he's not really like He's not really like a reachable person. Like he's, like imagine being like, okay, call the CEO of Facebook and get them into the morgue. Like, it's, not, it's gonna be a little harder than that, Captain. So he's like, well, fucking get him in, okay? And then he goes outside, he's like smoking cigarettes and you're just like, this is the dude that's on the case? Like, you're, I mean, I don't know how politics work, but if like a 45 year old CEO went missing, her dead body, her corpse is MIA, I feel like they'd probably call in the FBI. But then you've got this Captain who's like, it'll be fine. It's gonna be okay. Call in the dude. What's his name? Yeah, whatever, call him in. What? <laughs> so then we cut to where John is, and this is where he's gonna get the phone call. Now, John is actually at his, you guessed it, John can't keep his John in his pants at his mistress's house. And he starts asking the mistress about things, about like how she's feeling. You know, he asks her for a glass of water, and they start making out on the couch. And then he's like, well, so how are you feeling? And she's like, oh, well, I don't really feel any symptoms yet. It's only been seven weeks. It's implied that she's pregnant. So now we've got a lot of motives. My true crime brain was going ding, 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 motherfucking John. And so she's like, you know, it's only been seven weeks. And then as she's like getting water for him, she calls him Sunsing Nim. So you're like, wow. Okay, so this is probably one of her students. She, he has students. She looks a lot younger than him. And it's, oh God, it's just going to be a shit show now, huh? So then that's when John gets the call from the police station and they're like, listen, uh, the corpse is missing. You need to come to the morgue. And they tell him over the phone. So he freaks out, he hangs up and he asks his mistress for a, like, um, 
like a pack of Advil. And she's like, why? And he's like, just, just give it to me. And so he grabs the pack of Advil. He says, don't leave the house. Don't pick up any calls. Like, don't do anything. Something feels weird. And then he was like, I'll be right back. And he leaves and he speeds off in his Porsche and it's raining. Now he notices immediately that there's a sticker on his windshield. So he stops in the middle of the road to peel that sticker off. So I guess in Korea, they don't give you parking tickets. Like, you know how if you get a parking ticket, you get like a piece of paper in your dash, but maybe they like throw it away and be like, I don't I didn't see anything. Maybe someone walked by and threw it away, you know? So they like stick it on your windshield. Or this parking officer was just an ass and stuck a full ass sticker on his windshield, but it feels normal, okay? So it's a parking sticker, and so it's a fine. So he's peeling it off in the rain, then he gets back into the car and he starts driving, and that's where we get our first flashback. So we have a flashback to him talking to his wife, Veronica, when she was alive. And we see John putting a substance into her red wine glass before she comes home, and she just got back from like a business trip to the US, and she's like, oh, like I think I need something stronger than wine. It's been a rough trip. And he's like, no, 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 trust me, I just picked out this bottle myself and I think it's it's gonna be your taste and so she's holding it and the whole time that they're having this conversation she's just taking sniffs of it but never drinking it so it's just so weird like there's just so much tension and you can kind of tell that this isn't really a loving relationship she does look older than him she is definitely a lot more um she just has an aura about her. Like, she's got a presence, and he seems a little bit meek. And the whole time, you know, she seems really suspicious of him. She's like, you've been seeing your mom a lot recently, even though you say that you're so busy with teaching and everything going on with the new drug development. And he was just like, well, she's sick, so that's why. And he talked about how she had fired his assistant and why she had done that. And, like, why didn't you talk to me first? Like, this affects me too, right? And she said, because it's my company. And then that's where you get a little bit of tension of like, Fuck yeah, <laughs> you're like, girl power, you tell him, bitch, you tell him. And then so he's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Like, I'll never bring it up again. And he seems really mad, but he's saying it and like, like, he's scared of her almost. And so he's like, you're right, you're right. Like, that was my bad, my bad for even bringing this up to your attention, right? And then she's also like, hey, why don't you just skip your lecture and we'll go take a walk? Like, it's nice outside. And he gets really upset. He's like, what do you mean skip my class? Like, do you think what I do for a living is a joke? Like, is this a joke to you? And she's like, I think it's really cute when you get mad. And so everything is really demeaning. Like, she doesn't take anything he does seriously. It's almost like everything about him is just like, haha, funny. Like, not. I mean, I can kind of see it. Like, she's running this in massive fortune 500 company and he's like i gotta go teach my class right i get it but i don't like she's just really rude and so you can tell it's not a loving relationship and she's like it's okay and she like pets his head and then she, she he's like well i gotta go just rest and drink your wine so she takes a sip of the wine and then she looks at him and he looks at her and he's nervous and she looks mad for a second and then she looks at him and says you're right it's just my taste. And then downs the whole glass of wine while maintaining eye contact with him. And he just smiles and he's like feeling relieved. And he walks away. That was the flashback. So he gets to the morgue and he gets out of his car. We get like a whole dramatic opening the door of the Porsche, simple flavor, favor, what do you call it? The umbrella, dramatic scene, okay, in the rain. And he walks in and they get him into like the bottom of the morgue right next to where the bodies are. So the bodies are in this room and there's like this interrogation window almost where you can see into that room. And then there's like a desk here with a bunch of like office stuff here. So it's kind of connected. There's a door in between that you can connect the two. And so he's sitting there the the captain looks like he's just there for lunch like he's just like hey what's poppin and he sits down and the police are trying to tell him like her body is missing and of course john is not reacting well to this like he's kind of pissed off he's like what the do you mean like her corpse is missing like that doesn't even make sense this is a morgue isn't it like what are you what are you talking about and they're like i know i know we're really sorry about this like we're trying to get to the bottom of this and like you can tell that the police are scared of him because one of the detectives kept saying just to clarify like we're just investigating we, we didn't lose the corpse we're just investigating the missing corpse you know like he's trying to be like our police station please we have we're not we weren't in charge of making sure that the corpse didn't get stolen we're just trying to help you you know so they're very scared of him meanwhile the captain's just sitting on the side like 
looking around, just doing his thing, like literally doesn't even care. So during this initial conversation, John's phone rings multiple times because Heather is calling and, oh, by the way, Heather is his mistress. Of course her name's gonna be Heather in this one, okay? And Heather keeps calling, Heather keeps texting, he keeps quieting his phone. It doesn't seem like anybody really notices, but it's just kind of like, oof, you should be a little bit more careful, John. You should be a little bit smarter, mother forking John. God, I'm so mad at him for some reason. <laughs> and so Heather keeps texting and the police are just saying like, oh, by the way, he starts smoking cigarettes inside the morgue, which isn't allowed, but the police let him because they're scared of him. And the captain the whole time still hasn't said anything. And at one point, John will actually look over at the captain and the captain is snoring like in his chair. He's taking a nap because it's nighttime, right? He's taking a full on nap. So he's like, what is this? So he starts getting mad and he's like, I want to talk to your boss. Like, are you guys even, wh why am I here? Why are you guys asking me questions? Where is the security here? Where, like, I want to ask questions. Why are you guys asking me questions right now? And they're saying, listen, we're trying to get to the bottom of this. Does your wife have any enemies? No, not at all. No one. The captain wakes up and the captain says, what about you, John? Are you implying that I stole her corpse? No, 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 no. I'm implying maybe you have enemies and they're trying to get back at you so they steal your wife's corpse. Doesn't that kind of sound like it makes sense? And he's like, um, no, I don't really have any enemies. And what, what about the other corpses, right? Captain's like, well, they weren't really interested in any of the other corpses. They literally only took your wife's. None of the other drawers were even opened or touched and most of the zippers. So if they have been recently opened, you can tell and you can't tell. So it seems like they were really just after your wife. What, what, what kind of fucked up people steal corpses anyway? Well, that's the interesting thing, John. It wasn't people. You would think that it would be people, right? But it wasn't. And then he briskly walks over to the door and he says, listen, let me show you guys something. Right next to the morgue door, there's a little scratch mark. And he says, get this. If there were people, these doors, they open inward. And the minute that you let go of them, they swing shut and they lock because you need a passcode to get into here. And they're really, really heavy doors. So if you were, if you were with a group of people, why would there be a mark on the ground? The mark indicates that they had moved this massive cabinet over to keep the door open. Yes? And that's when John looks at him and goes, exactly, if there were two people, one of them would have just kept the door open while someone grabbed my wife's body and then would have left instead of moving the cabinet to keep the door open. Precisely. So it was one person. So this is kind of like our glimpse of like, Maybe the captain is good at his job. So what he's saying is like there was an indentation saying that the cabinet right next to the door had been moved to keep the door open. And so they wouldn't have done that if there was multiple people involved in the crime because why go through all that hassle when someone could just stand guard at the door and keep the door open? That would be faster, that'd be less suspicious. But instead they moved that heavy cabinet to open the door. So it seems like it was just the doing of one person. Now why would one person have it out for his wife's corpse? So then the captain immediately goes, that's why I think, John, can I have a cigarette, please? <laughs> and so John is like, okay. And he opens his cigarette drawer and he gives it to him and he takes a cigarette and you can see that John's hand is shaking a little bit and the captain's eyeballs go big. Oh my God. There's gonna be plot twists though. I know, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, easy. But then, but then plot twist after plot twist after plot twist. And then all of a sudden, before the captain can say anything, a police officer walks in and says, hey, the, the, the morgue doctor is here. And the morgue doctor would like to ask John a couple of questions. So they all sit down with the morgue doctor and she's sitting there and she says, listen, um, I just wanna get some questions of your wife. You said that she has a phobia of flying. Yeah, why does that have to do anything? And she just got back that day. So she had died earlier that day. So she just got back today from the United States and then she died and she has a phobia of flying, yes? Yeah. And so that's why we probably think it was a heart attack, right? I mean, I'm not the doctor, you are. All right, well, does your wife have any history of mental illness? What does that have anything to do with this? And so she's saying, well, okay, so just to give you some perspective, I found that she does have records at a psychiatric hospital, but because the records are sealed, I have no idea what the contents are. I have no idea if she has maybe anxiety or depression or anything, and that might be pertinent to the case. Why would that be pertinent? Because she could be taking medication. John's like, what? Why does that matter? Okay. 
the morgue doctor is like, listen, everyone, it's gonna sound a little crazy, but I have a theory. Have you ever heard something called catalepsy? I think your wife might have went into cataleptic shock. Um, it slows the heart rate down and the lungs down to the point where we think that she's dead, but she might not actually be dead. And maybe sometimes mental illness, like they will prescribe you, like if you have like depression or things like that, sometimes they will do it prescribe you things. Also, I don't know if this is factually true. It's a fucking movie. They'll prescribe you things that could send you possibly if you react negatively to the medicine into, you know, that type of shock. And maybe she's not dead. And maybe she walked out of here because none of this is making sense. And typically when people do walk out of their graves or like walk out of their morgue like that, it's such a rare case. And usually they're in so much shock that they don't immediately call their loved ones or they don't immediately go to the police or try to figure out what happened. A lot of the times they will be wandering because they don't understand what happened. So we kind of suspect maybe that's what's going on. John's like, are you fucking kidding me? There's no way. And he's like, are you implying that my wife's not actually dead? And she's like, precisely. So the doctor goes to the three police officers, the detectives and the captain, and they go into the next room and they start talking just with them. And John's by himself. And she's saying, listen, I know it sounds crazy, but it's really rare. But because it's rare, we can't completely rule it out. You know, we have to leave everything on the table. And that's when the captain looks at her and goes, we have to leave everything on the table. The autopsy wasn't done. We have to leave everything on the table. What do they teach you in police school? Any death is a homicide until you can rule it out. But because we have no autopsy, we can't rule it out. So this is a homicide. And the detectives are like, sir, you've been drinking a lot. Like, this isn't a homicide. Like, everyone in Korea knows this woman. Like, no one's trying to kill this lady. Like, she had a heart attack. Her body's missing. I know it's the middle of the night. You want to be creeped out. The security guard was like, I saw a ghost. And now, you know, the morgue doctor is like, she's alive. It's not a homicide, okay? <sighs> and he's like, no, no, no. Let's think about it, though. Because right now, there's no evidence. But if there was a body, if there was an autopsy, there would be evidence. So if she can't rule out cataleptic shock, then we can't rule out a homicide. Am I right, team? And they're like, okay, fine. Let's say it's a homicide. Who would take her body? Who would take her body? Let's say she's dead. Then it's a homicide. Who would take her body? The person who killed her. Who would kill her? The person who has the most to gain. This is literally simple police work. And they all look over and they're like, okay, not John. Definitely not John. D D John's not gonna kill his wife. Do you know? Okay, this is common amongst regular folk like us. You know, we could just kill our significant others, think we can get away with it. But it's not happening in their world. Like, there's no way he would get away with it anyway. And the police is like, well, I don't know. Well, think about the way it works in Korea. The death certificate comes out, and then you're entitled to life insurance and probably most of her assets. So he does have the most to gain. So the captain goes back in to question John and he says, listen, forget about what that lady says. Crazy morgue doctors, am I right? Let me just ask you a couple more questions and we'll be done here. Does your wife have any enemies? No, I already told you no. Okay, well, does she have anyone close to her? Someone who, you know, she's, she trusts. Maybe her niece, she doesn't really have a lot of friends. Okay, well, was she having an affair? No. How would you know, though, if she's having an affair so definitively? Uh, because she's my wife? I, I, be, she's not having an affair. Okay. Where were you tonight? We called your house first and you didn't pick up before we called your cell phone. <laughs> Why are you asking me where I was tonight? Oh my god. Are you guys serious? I want to talk to your boss, Captain, because why are you questioning? I was at the pharmacy okay my head was hurting my wife died today now i'm getting questioned at a freaking morgue i was at the pharmacy buying advil oh really i'd love to see the advil <sighs> okay he reaches into his suit pocket and pulls out an advil are you happy now i got some advil oh well you must have been at the pharmacy a really long time because i walked over to your car just to make sure and I found a little piece of your parking ticket. Was that from today? Because it was raining, so it probably is from today. Were you there a long time? 
So then at this point, John's getting really riled up. He's like, I'm the one that lost my wife. I'm the one that lost my loved one. Why are you questioning? Where's your boss? I want to talk to you about I want to get my lawyer. Get my lawyer on the phone. And so then this is when they just leave the room to let him call his attorney and all of them go and grab coffee. So like they have like the vending machines of coffee in the morgue. So they're just drinking coffee. And the captain is talking to the morgue doctor and he's just saying, no, that dude's weird. I know something's wrong with that guy. And the lady's like, no, no. I mean, it's just everyone reacts to shock differently. And he's saying, you literally just told him that his wife might be alive. Did you see him even a little excited? Did you see him even a little happy at the chance? And she's like, no, listen, you can't just like put a label on shock because you just don't understand if you don't. I'm sorry. I don't know why. It must have slipped my mind. I'm sorry. I, you know what I meant, right? And so this is kind of when we get the inkling that he probably lost someone, the captain. And this is why she was like, you don't understand when people lose people. And then she's like, oh, fuck, like, I'm sorry. I don't know why I just said that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know what I meant. And then that's when the conversation changes to listen, if you ever need to talk to someone, like we're here for you. So this is a government run or morgue. So it seems like they work really close to each other. So then at this point, he's like, it's okay, like, don't worry, I'm not taking it to heart. And then the lights start flickering and the lights go off again. So then John's alone, by the way, all of the detectives are drinking coffee and the lights go off. So he walks over and he tries to turn on the lights. It won't turn on, obviously. And then he goes to sit back down when he hears like a squeaking noise. And he turns around and through the glass, he can see where the morgue drawers are and he sees one of them open. And it's the one where his wife went missing because they kept pointing at it. So he walks over and now there's no body inside but there is a box inside that box was the box of belongings that came in on veronica's body so it had a ziploc that would have her cell phone which by the way was empty and then it had a ziploc of like all of her wallets and stuff that was literally on her body because they have to keep evidence like that and one of them was the bottle of that fluid that he had put into the wine what that he had killed her with, poisoned her with. It was in there? Poison, yeah. And he freaks out and he drops it and he's like looking around like, oh my God, is Veronica alive? And so we get another flashback and this flashback is of, of the John describing to Heather about this drug. And he said that the Baron Pharmacy is undergoing drug development for this new drug that is really intense. They think that they're going to get investment on it because it's, it's solid. So immediately you can see patients reacting to it and they don't exactly know the purpose of the drug yet, but it seems like it could potentially be a breakthrough drug. So right now it's odorless. It is just colorless it dissolves into water and you can see the effects on the patients within hours if you get too large of a dosage it's also tasteless by the way if you give too large of a dosage to a patient they could die their lungs will stop their heart will stop very slowly until they die they slowly lose consciousness they become paralyzed and within about eight hours they're probably dead if you give them too much and so he's explaining this to Heather, his mistress, and she's like, what? And he says, you know what's worse than death? The fact that it's untraceable. This drug, you can't trace it in the body, which is why we think we're going to get so much investment on it. And she's like, y you don't think something like that should be destroyed if it could kill people? And he turns around and he looks out the window and he says, no, because there still might be some use for it. So then that's when we go back to the morgue and the lights turn on and the police detectives are literally right outside the door and they're about to open the door when John freaks out and he reaches down, grabs the bottle and shoves it in his pocket. We can see that the captain saw him do this. So um, he's like, okay, well, what is this? Why are you in this room? And they see that the evidence drawer, like the box of all of Veronica's stuff is open. So they walk over and one of the detectives says, oh, this is the Ziploc it says for her phone, her phone's missing. Captain's like, all right, John, empty your pockets. Let's see those pockets. Excuse me? Oh, I just want to see your pockets. Just empty your pockets. Do you have her phone? Do you have your dead wife's phone? Is something on her phone? He's like, what are you talking about? I don't have, my why would I take my, oh, you guys are disgusting. I demand to talk to your boss, Captain. And he's like, ah, just empty your pockets. And he starts dead manhandling John. He's like reaching into his pockets and he pulls out a bottle 
of the poison. Now, of course, because it was tested at Barron Pharmacy, we see that the label has the pharmacy names and stuff, but it doesn't have like the name of the drug. It doesn't even say what it is. It doesn't have like a poison skull symbol, you know? He's just like, what is this? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. And so the morgue doctor is like, I don't know, that's not from inside our morgue. I've never seen that bottle before. So he's like, okay, well, can you get it tested in the lab and see what's inside this bottle? She's like, absolutely, Captain. And she's like, I'm on it. So she leaves. And John, the whole time, he's just privileged out. He's like, you'll be hearing from my attorney about the way that you just manhandled me and just shoved your hand into my pocket. Absolutely, you'll be hearing from my attorney. And he's like, I'm sorry, John. Like, do you not understand the situation right now? You're not leaving the morgue until we find out what the f*** is in that bottle. And that's when the captain gets a phone call. And his phone is really loud. And he's kind of funny. He's like, I don't know why they make phones so loud these days. And it's his boss yelling at him, saying, are you f***ing out of your mind? Are you interrogating John right now? The jo the husband of the CEO of the are you f***ing losing your marbles? And the boss is yelling at him and he's just like, ah, yeah, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're right, you're right. Okay, bye. And he just like hangs up on his boss. And John's like, okay, so I'm free to go, obviously. And he's like, no, you're in the possession of what I think is a murder weapon. And John's like, what the fork? So then the police leave him and they have a morgue security officer look after John and he looks like he don't know what he just got himself into the security officer. So then the police go, they're looking at the floor plans of the morgue and the, the captain is just telling the detectives like we need to find another way in. There's no way, like there's no way that the perpetrator walked through the front door. There's no way a body just goes missing and they didn't use the front door. You need to find another way in. So he sends two detectives to go search the entire grounds of the morgue to see if there's an open somewhere and then he sends another officer another detective to go see Veronica's younger sister who also happens to be the company's attorney so she, he's just like figure what's going out I want to see if there's some sort of prenup or something like that's what he's on to because it's all suspicious now at this point this is when the two detectives go outside and they're searching the outgrounds of the morgue and they see this little opening it looks like a drainage tunnel like where it would rain because the morgue is kind of on like this really bushy hill like a wooded hill and they see this tunnel, they see the bars, and it's left open. So the bars itself, it doesn't look like someone can crawl through them, like it's not skinny enough or like big enough that a like a human can like crawl through, but it was open. So they're like, you know what we gotta do, right? We gotta go crawl through this tunnel to see what's at the other end. So they're crawling through the tunnel, and at the same time, there's electricians who are called into the morgue to see what happened to the generator. Why does it keep going off? And at that point, they hear a random boom. So they freak out and right next to them, a door opens and it's the detectives who are soaking wet from the rain outside. They're muddy, they just crawled through the tunnel. So now we know that the tunnel from the outside leads straight into the morgue, especially near where the electrical box is. So it'd very, be very convenient to turn off the electricity like that. So the electricians also tell the captain they don't think that the electricity kept going out was an accident. They think that the wires were deliberately cut. It's the strangest thing. They also said that there's one CCTV footage that has been saved because the rest, the whole building is run by the building and is hooked up to this generator. However, there is one camera right outside on the main street of the morgue that's run by the government and that one is not hooked up to this generator and you can see any and all of the cars that were passing in this general vicinity when the body was missing. So they go through all the cars and what they find is interesting is only their cars were there. There was no extra car. Police cars and the dude's car, John's Porsche, that's it. So the rookie security guard, he's watching John and John asks to go to the bathroom. So he's taking a leak when he calls Heather and Heather is like, are you okay? What's going on? You're not answering my calls. Something feels wrong. I feel like something's off. Something feels... I just feel spooked out, like please come back, like just leave the morgue, tell them to get your attorneys on it. And she's like, and, and some number keeps calling me, I don't know who it is. And he's like, just ignore it, whatever you do, don't pick up that number, it could be like an attorney, it could be a setup. And so she's like, okay, like I won't. And he's thinking to himself the whole time like, how can there be another bottle? I destroyed all the bottles of the drug. How is this possible? And then he sees the bathroom window and it's raining outside. And on the window still, there's a card. And he walks up to it, and it's an invitation to a Madame Butterfly charity party. Shut I know. Up. Connection to the butterfly collector, bam, Shut that we did. The front, door. front door, yeah. 
front door. Madam Butterfly. Madam Butterfly. Same charity organization. Is it for real? Yeah. It's a real charity? Oh, I don't know. So it's a card to the Madam Butterfly charity organization, and it's got a butterfly on the front card, and on the back it says, To Professor My Love. And we get another flashback. So we find out that Heather is pregnant, and John had gone to pick her up from the hospital where she was, she had her hand injured because a car had actually swerved into her on the sidewalk, and she had jumped fallen on her wrist and her wrist was dislocated and he was like did you get a good look at the car like did you see anything and she was like no I, I think the car was just like a black car I don't remember it's okay though they said that the baby's okay everything's okay like don't worry and he hugs her in the middle of the street and he sees a car in the corner of his eye and it's a black car and it drives away when he looks at it so he's like huh so he's like, okay, well, I'll see you tomorrow, okay? He gets into his car, he goes home, and that's where he, Veronica is just doing yoga in the apartment. And she walks up to him, he sees the Madam Butterfly invitation, and she's like, oh, are you excited about the party? Like, we can go pick out a new suit for you? And she asks where he's been all night. Oh, I was just doing some research in the lab, but I, I checked the lab, you weren't there. Yeah, but I was doing research in a different lab at school because it was for a lecture and not for the drug. Okay, well, I think maybe we should put the drug development on hold. You're busy, I'm busy. It's draining a lot of resources and time, and I never get to see you anymore. And it's an old invitation, is what he's clarifying, right? So it's from, like, when she was alive. So it's there again, and it had the same writing. So, I mean, who would have an invitation like that? And so he's like, well, we can't put the drug on hold. We have so many people depending on it to go through. Like, so many. think about all the researchers who worked on this case. And she just smiles at him and she says, okay, well, I'll let Mr. Wan close the case and he'll take care of it. And he's like, Mr. Wan, what the, f what the f does he know? He's not even good at his job. How are you just gonna let him handle the rest of the drug case that we've been working on for years? And she looks at him and like, this woman is so composed. She looks at him and she says, do you think you are in the position you are because you are good at your job? And he says, you're right, my fault. It won't happen again. What? He a little bitch baby, okay? First of all, she abates and he abates baby, so whatever. And so she hugs him and she cries, like very silently. And she asks, do you love me? And he says, yeah, why would you ask something like that? She's like, well, why don't, if you love me, why don't we just spend a year in the US? We can work abroad, it'll be fun, we can travel more. Yeah, yeah, let me let me think about it. Let me let's think about it. Let's not be too rash, you know? Let's think about it. Okay. Well, do you need to buy a new car or something? No, you, you just bought me one like last week. Okay. Okay. So it seems like, you know, she loves him kind of in her own weird twisted way mm -hmm. and is trying to use money to tie him down. But it also kind of implies that she probably knows about Heather's pregnancy because being in the U.S. for a year is a very interesting question to ask. Not even just like, let's travel, but for like a year, right? And then at the end, she hugs him and she says, you know, you can never leave me, right? And he says, I know, I love you. And it kind of implies that it's not just about money for some reason, like the whole car thing, but then also the way she asks, it seems like, oh, even if it wasn't about money, like, you know you can never leave me. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of odd. So like, it sounds like she's got like hitmen on call. Mm. <laughs> and so then we go back to the bathroom and that's when John is like still on the phone with Heather and she's like, hello, hello. And he's just in shock looking at the Madam Butterfly invitation. And he's like, Heather, does anybody know else know about us? Does anyone know about us? And she's like, no, what are you talking about? And he hears a noise and he hangs up and the captain is looking at him. And we don't know how much of that conversation he overheard. Now, one of the other cops goes to Veronica's sister's house, the attorney of the company, to ask her a bunch of questions. This is the middle of the night, so she seems like she just woke up. Her husband looks like he just woke up. They're both in PJs, and she's sitting there, and she looks kind of weird. Like, she looks very emotionless at this moment, and he's like, well, do you, do you know anything suspicious? Because maybe we're, we're kind of investigating, like, a homicide now. And she's like, my sister's been murdered? What? And they're like, well, or she might be alive. You know, we don't really know what's going on. And she's like, she might be alive. 
and she just looks shocked. And the cop is like, well, is there anything, anything in the company files, anything that could point to John being a little weird? And the husband says, honey, honey, show her the agreement. Show him the agreement. The agreement? And so we get a little like flash forward scene of the cop sitting with the, the husband who's like a little nosy. He's like, look at the agreement, you know? And he's reading over it and he's like, God, this is hell of an agreement. Who would agree to this? And we don't know what this, you know, what the agreement is. And then we're like, he looks over and he's like, hello, can you believe this? And he's looking for Veronica's sister, the attorney, and she's grabbing a glass of water, but the water is now spilling from the counter to the ground and she's looking at her phone in shock. So the cop is like, are you okay, ma'am? And then it cuts. And so then this point, Captain shows John the CCTV footage of the main road and he's like, listen, dude, only we have driven this road, so just tell me, tell me, where do you think your wife's body is? Because we're the only ones. The only other side on the other side of this road of the morgue is that big wooded hill. You think your wife's in that wooded hill? Think about it, one person, your wife, how much does she weigh? Now one person is carrying her through the hill? Does that make any sense to you? And so then the captain's like, well, I've got a theory. She wasn't carried through the woods. I think someone took her out of the morgue so that there was no autopsy, and they put her body for safekeeping in the woods nearby. And I think you're here right now, so you can't go back and get that body. So I think, I think we're gonna find that body right outside the morgue. We just gotta, we just need some time to do a little digging, and we're gonna find her body, and we're gonna do an autopsy, and you mother forker, I think you poisoned her. And so John is looking at him like, okay, whatever. Like he's, he already looks like he's got some shit going on. For me, it seems like John believes that his wife is alive and the captain believes the wife is dead. So it's like they're working very two different cases. So John's worried that his wife is alive. That's actually worse for him than his wife being dead and like the body is missing, you know? And so it seems like they're worried about different things. And the captain is walking out of the room. And this is a new room, by the way. And John turns to the room and there's a calendar, a digital calendar on the wall that has the time in real life and then also the date that today's supposed to be but instead of today it's a date from years ago years ago so this movie was released in like 2019 so um it was based in current time so like 2018 right mm -hmm. but it says july 20th 2007 and so the captain looks at it and it's like the fuck are broken or something and john looks at it and he looks like he's seen a ghost and he's like i i don't know and you can see that he's like thinking about something and he's walking into the elevator with the captain when the captain gets a call. And like I said, the captain's phone is too loud. So John's gonna hear everything. And so then the first call that the captain gets is from one of the cops who is with Veronica's sister, right? Mm -hmm. And the cop says, listen, I know it's gonna sound crazy, but we're on the way to the headquarters of Barron Pharmacy right now. And he's like, okay, why? Well, I think it's some sort of sick prank, but Veronica's sister just got a text from Veronica's phone saying, come meet me at the office. I don't think Veronica's alive, okay, but some sort of sick prank. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna make sure. I'm with them in the car right now and we're headed to the office. And then another call. The detectives that were searching the grounds looking for Veronica's body, uh -huh. they call and they say, Captain, we've got something weird. Yeah, what is it? Well, we found footprints into the woods, so it seems like you're right, they took the tunnels, they didn't drive, but the footprints are too small. I think it's a female's footprints. So John is freaking out. Once they get out of the elevator, the sprinklers were going off downstairs in the basement for some reason. It looks like the captain's shook. So he's like, "Hey, what the hell, right? And he's running through the hallway trying to duck under his folders because the sprinklers are going off. And this is when John was able to sneak off into a different like storage room and he's calling Heather. Now he's like, Heather, Heather, you've been mentioning you've been getting weird calls. What was the number again? And she's like, oh, okay, hold on. And she checks her phone log and recites the number. And he's like, that's, that's Veronica's phone number. And he tells her to lock the doors, don't go anywhere, and stay safe. And he mentions some weird shit going on. There's a day, July 20th. Only the two of us know that day, but she put it on the calendar here. I think she's alive. And so he's thinking out loud, and Heather's listening. The drug didn't work. They were talking about, they were talking. Oh my God, I didn't know. I didn't know she was seeing a psychiatrist. They said that she could be, the drug doesn't work. 
if the patient is using antidepressants. There could be some sort of, there could be some sort of, maybe it didn't work? No, but there's no way she was on antidepressants without me knowing, right? And Heather's like, wait, I don't think your wife would, she's not the type to take antidepressants. No, that's worse. If she's not taking antidepressants and the drug I used on her didn't counteract with the antidepressants, that means the only other theory is that she knew all along what I was going to do. With every drug that we make at Barron Pharmacy, we make an antidote. That's the only way. That's the only way we won't be held liable. That's the best way to market drugs. That means she knew all along what I was going to do to her. Heather, you need to be safe. You need to lock your doors. Heather? And he looks at his phone, and his phone is dead. And the door opens, and the captain is there. So then the cops, they go to Veronica's office and nobody's there. So he's like, oh, of course, like it, it was obviously a sick prank. Veronica's not alive. Who the hell has her phone? What the hell is going on? And that's when they find a letter on her desk that was from Veronica mailed to Veronica. And so he asks the sister, like, can we take this as evidence? Because who mails a letter to themselves, right? And it wasn't like she mailed it from the US, like she mailed it from her office to her office again. Very strange. So he was like, do you mind if I open it? And she was like, go ahead. And he was like, oh, shit. And it cuts. Then we go back to the morgue and the captain is asking the electricians, like, what set off the sprinklers in the basement? And they say, We've, we found this in the bathroom. And I guess like someone was smoking a cigarette and it went off and the sprinklers went off. And he looks at the cigarette and it was, you guessed it, the same brand that he saw John had. So he's like, huh. So then the morgue doctor rushes in and she's like, guys, it's a poison. It's a poison. I just tested it. It's a poison. I don't have a full report of all the ingredients, but I know it's a poisonous material. So the doctor is like, get me a report ASAP. That's evidence. And she's like, okay, you were right. I, this is crazy. So she rushes back out. So at the same time, the boss calls the captain and the boss is not being nice. And the captain's saying, listen, it's a poison. He had the poison in his pocket. The dude's a murderer, okay? I need more men. I need backup. And the boss is like, you need backup? You're gonna need backup when I beat your ass, dude. You better let that kid go. We're all gonna lose our jobs. How dare you be questioning a fucking Tibor right now? Like, do you not understand that they literally run this country and we're literally gonna be homeless in two days because we're gonna lose our fucking jobs? Like, Get him out of here. His wife died today, you mother forker. And he's freaking out. And he's like, what if someone did this to you? What if on that day, someone interrogated you? And then we get a flashback. So the captain, he was a rookie cop. He wasn't even a captain. He wasn't even like a detective at this point. And he was so busy with all of these cases that his girlfriend had called. And he's like, fuck. And he picks up and he goes, oh. It was today, wasn't it? It was today. She's like, it's okay, it's okay. I know, I know you're busy with work. And he was supposed to go to her parents' grave with her because it was the annual death day anniversary. And she was going with her little sister. It's like in the rural area because in Korea, there's really not a lot of land. So most of the cemeteries are in rural areas. And she's like, it's fine. We just got off the bus and it's a short walk. We'll be fine. And he's like, are you sure? You don't need me to pick you up or something? It's getting dark. It's getting dark. She's like, it's okay. Go solve some murders, okay? We'll be home soon. And she hangs up the phone and her little sister, who seems a lot younger than her, is like, oh, honey, my like, ankle hurts. And she's like, oh, okay. So she grabs a Band-Aid and is putting a Band-Aid on her shoe when all of a sudden a car comes and hits both of them. Meanwhile, John is freaking out and he wants to be released because he thinks someone's trying to kill Heather. And he's alone in one of the rooms, like a bathroom room, and it's a small window. Like a, pro a human couldn't crawl through there, but it keeps slamming open and shut because of the wind. And he walks up to it, and there's a red wine glass there, just on the window. And he's like, what? Because, you know, he poisoned his wife with red yeah. wine. So he's still at the morgue. Then he goes back into the interrogation room, and he's just sitting, waiting, right? Because his phone is dead, and he's freaking out, and he doesn't even know where the captain is at this point. And that's when he hears a phone ring. And it's coming from inside the drawers of dead people. So he walks over, and he can hear exactly which body bag it's coming from. And he unzips it, the phone is ringing, and he grabs the phone out, and Veronica's phone number is calling. He picks it up, and they hang up. So then he tries calling again. There's no answer. So then he's like, Fuck, 
what's in the bag. So he opens up the body bag. So suspenseful. But it's just an old harabaji. What's harabaji? Old grandpa. And then a text message arrives on the phone. I'm waiting for you at our secret place, July 20th, 2007. And so at this point, a commotion happens. So the boss arrives with literally two vans full of police officers and the captain meets him outside and he's like, well, right, listen, 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 let me give you all my evidence. And he's like, nah, and arrest him. We're going to get him, right? And so the boss is like, we're not arresting you, dude. You know I love you, but you can't do this. We're going to all lose our jobs. You see all these men? All of us are going to lose our jobs. So all the men are like, we're not going to lose our jobs because of you, Forker. And so they're trying to arrest him. And he's about to get pulled away. And he's like, just give me five minutes. When the other detective rolls up with a file and says, everybody stop. The file that Veronica had mailed to herself. Uh -huh. And that's when the boss is like. And then you see the boss telling the captain, you can question him. And this time, it was a full-blown interrogation. He pulled out an audio recorder, he's recording the whole thing, and he pulls out the prenuptial agreement. That was the first thing he pulls out. And he says, if P party A is found of having an affair, then party B can sue that person and they will have literally no claim to any and all assets. Like, they will lose everything. And also, Veronica had hired a private investigator company right before her death, and they found out that you were cheating. They have pictures of you making out with Heather. Look at all these pictures. He's pulls out all of these pictures of them making out and shit. and on top of that they were able to record you saying this remember that drug conversation uh -huh. they recorded that between him and heather what how because private investigators be gnarly they also found out that he had rented that apartment where heather was staying at under his name uh -huh. so it wasn't even heather's apartment like veronica knew exactly how to get access to that apartment and probably set up listening devices because I mean, it was technically her money that got that apartment. And also, like, she's the one in charge. Like, no one in Korea is like, oh, John. They're all like, f***ing Veronica, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, they got the audio recording. So that's intent. You're, you, this is literally premeditated murder, dude. Like, you said you are going to try to kill her in the tape. He plays the tape for him. So he's like, all right, tell me what's up. So then John rushes to the bathroom, and he immediately starts throwing up, which is kind of like a sign that you're guilty, right? And the boss is like, listen. Captain, you've got one hour. Get a confession or find the body. This is still circumstantial evidence for someone who has that much money. This could technically be buried. So get the confession. So he's like, okay. So then after he throws up in the bathroom, he starts getting all of this, all of these text messages on the phone that he found in the body bag, John. And it's all pictures of him, him and Heather just like making out, holding hands literally everywhere. So he's like, oh, like this is real right um and then even when he before he went into the morgue because veronica's body went missing you know how i said he went to heather's to make out there were pictures of that so that's when john calls heather and he says listen heather it's me listen to what i have to say are all of your doors locked right now yeah i need you to go to the front door right now and calmly walk away walk out of the apartment but don't act like anything's wrong, okay, Heather? Just listen to what I have to say. Get your bag and walk out of the apartment and go somewhere with a lot of people, okay? What's, what's wrong? Do what I tell you, please. And so she's like, okay. And she goes to her room and grabs her bag. And by the time she gets back out of her room, the balcony door is open. So she runs to the door and he can hear her and he's like, what's going on, Heather? What's going on? Tell me. And then she screams and drops the phone. So at this point, John runs out of the bathroom and he's like, Veronica's going to kill Heather. Veronica's going to kill Heather. Veronica's killing Heather. And uh, he's trying to run out of the morgue and he gets body slammed by the captain. And then he's back into the interrogation room and the captain is like, listen, we want to help you. And if someone's going to kill someone, we want to prevent that. But you got to tell us what's going on. And so John's flashback happens and he says, this is what happened. Not long after the drug development, um, he started teaching classes again at the local school because he just needed a sense of self and that's when he met a student. And then we get a flashback of the classroom. And it's the question of him asking all of the students, so what would be the purpose of a drug like this? And no one raises their hands. When all of a sudden, a shy girl from the back raises her hand and he says, you. She stands up and she says, the purpose of that drug would to be to save as many lives as possible. Isn't that 
the end goal to save people's lives. And she, he looks at her and he says, but this is an anti-itch cream. And everyone starts laughing. And she's, <laughs> so like, we thought she was gonna be like this genius, but um, she's actually just like really dumb, okay? <laughs> <laughs> she's like to save lives he's like this is an itch cream like what do you t it's aloe vera bitch what do you <laughs> and so he said so of course i really hated her as a student at first she was really annoying she would constantly ask questions after class and i was like i just realized this isn't even your major why are you asking so many questions okay but then slowly i don't know it just kind of happened you know, to Veronica, I was just a trophy. She could literally have anything in the world. It didn't matter what anyone or anything in the world thought about her or what they wanted because Veronica just could conquer it all. But Heather, Heather, we would go on these bike rides or we would study in the library and she would ask what my dreams were, what I wanted to do in my life, what my future was going to be like. And Veronica never asked that. She just told me. And, and I just slowly, just slowly started falling in love with her. And Veronica started, you know, being suspicious. So she told me to come into the office every single day and to not teach school. And, you know, I, I tried. I tried everything that I could. And I wanted to quit Heather because I knew how Veronica can be. If Veronica found out about Heather, it would be bad. But it just, it wasn't easy. And then we get a flashback of them making out in the library. Ooh, troubled love. Heather was the only thing keeping it alive. And then Heather fell pregnant. Heather had nothing to do with it, but he, he only planned to somehow protect Heather because Veronica would have killed Heather, okay? You gotta believe me, Captain. Veronica would have killed Heather. You think that she wouldn't have, but she would have killed Heather and she would have killed my unborn baby. But it, it doesn't matter. Veronica, Veronica probably already knew the whole time. And if it was a matter of money, she would have just let me go. But Veronica doesn't really even care about money. That's not her style. So the captain's like, so you killed her. Because you got your mistress pregnant. No, no, she's not dead. She's trying to kill my mistress right now. What do you not understand? Listen, when we developed the drug, that the drug that your morgue doctor took away from me, we also developed an antidote. We do that with every single drug that we have, and she probably knew all along, and she probably administered the antidote after she drank that wine. I should have known she was suspicious of that wine, right? And then she probably got one of her little... P.I.s to drag her out of the morgue or she walked out. I don't know, but she's alive and she's trying to kill Heather. You don't understand. So Veronica died and then came back alive and now she's trying to kill your pregnant mistress. That's really dumb. Like, that's just what the captain's like. He's just like, you know, it's really dumb. <laughs> You're dumb. <laughs> and so then, you know, there's a tap on the glass. So then the captain goes outside and he comes back and he says, all right, so there is an apartment under your name. Let's talk about that. And he says, I know, that's where I was keeping the mistress Heather. And I think that's where Veronica is right now, trying to kill Heather, like I told you. We just sent detectives over there and the manager of the building told us no one's lived there in months. We also checked the school that you taught at. There is no Heather, not even in your class, not in your whole school. No, no, no. <laughs> No, this this is literally all Veronica's game. Like, she probably paid the school to get rid of Heather's records. She probably paid the building manager to tell you these things. This We're literally playing into Veronica's game to make me seem crazy, but she's alive. And the captain's like, all right. Veronica's dead, and there's no one named Heather. And so at this point, John has a full-on mental breakdown. And he's crying, screaming that Heather's going to die soon because Veronica's alive. And that's when the boss walks in and says, these dudes in suits came to pick up John. So the dudes in suits came, right? And he's like, we got to let them go. Like, we can try to figure it out tomorrow, but the dudes in suits are not leaving until John leaves. And so at this point, they let John go, and he rushes into his Porsche, and he speeds off. Now, the, the captain is like, hey. Well, I'm going to go head home. And one of the detectives is like, sir, the boss told me I got to watch you and I got to bring you home tonight. He doesn't want you going on another drinking binge or anything. And the captain's like, oh, okay, well, you drive then. Oh, fuck, I left my keys in the, can you go get them? I left them in the office. And he's like, okay. So he walks inside. 
And the captain rushes into his car, turns it on, and drives after John. Now what we find out is that somehow he put a tracker on John. Or did he? Someone put a tracker on John. And he's following the tracker, and John is headed straight to the secret place of July 20th, 2007. And the captain is following him, and he has no idea where this dude's going. So he's following, following. Then we see John enter into like this wooded area with this giant mansion, and he has the keys to the mansion. He opens it up, and it looks like it was like their prior home or like a vacation home because there's wedding photos of the two of them, him and Veronica all over the place. And he searches room by room, and he can't find anyone. So then he goes into the woods behind the mansion. And the captain follows him through the woods. John keeps hearing noises and he thinks it's Veronica. And the captain's like, why is this dude out here? So then finally, we think it's gonna be Veronica, right? But it's the captain. And the John is like, listen, you've gotta help me. And the captain says, oh, so this is where you hid Veronica's body, huh? It is a discreet location. We would have never guessed this place. We didn't actually even know that you guys had a mansion here. Did you guys buy it under a different name? Maybe a shell company or something? It's a nice place. So where's Veronica's body? He's like, no, listen, 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 she's alive. And the captain says, oh, you're such an idiot. Let me tell you something. Listen, I lost someone too. It's so hard when you lose someone. And he pulls out his phone and shows him the screensaver of his girlfriend that died. And he says, look closely, I lost her too. I was supposed to go to the grave with her on her parents' death anniversary and then she got hit by a car. And do you know how much guilt I had? Do you know how much guilt I had? Her younger sister got hit by the car too, but guess what? She survived the hit and run, and I went to the hospital every day showing her pictures of all these other car models, and I said, do you, do you remember the car? But the little sister, she didn't remember a fucking thing. Didn't remember a thing. Couldn't remember the car, couldn't remember a license plate number, nothing. It's depressing. Can you imagine being a cop and your girlfriend dies and you can't even figure out who hit her? Oh, so obviously, the younger sister grows up, I go my separate ways, I become a detective, I become a captain, I, I lose a part of myself, I just pour myself into work. And then one day, the younger sister, my girlfriend, the woman I was gonna get married to, she gets arrested. And I'm like, what are you getting arrested for? So I take her out to eat, and then I find out that she didn't have amnesia. She pulls out a magazine that she had stolen from the library and she points to a page, and she points to a logo, and it was the Baron Pharmacy logo. And she says, that's the one. So I did some investigating, and the car that hit my girlfriend on July 20th, 2007, was run by Baron Pharmacy, and it was registered under John. And he starts beating up John, and he says, where did you hide my girlfriend's body? Is it here? Oh my god! Then we see a flashback of John and Veronica in the car. John is the one driving and he hits the captain's girlfriend and the little sister in the rural town. And the little sister goes flying, she stays alive, and she remembers like the logo of the car before she gets run off the road that was in the very front. Like sometimes you can put logos. And the, the girlfriend, I mean, she's like bleeding on the side of the road. And that's when Veronica is like, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And then he's like trying to call the cops. And Veronica's like, are you kidding? You're drunk. You're just going to throw away your whole future like that? And so they look at the girl and she's gone. The captain's girlfriend's gone. She's not on the side of the road anymore. She's actually walking away into the woods to get her little sister. And they look at her and she collapses again. And she's still alive but they decide to drag her into the car. And then we get a flashback of Veronica and John digging in the back of this mansion. And he's crying and he hugs her and she says, from now on, just always do as I say and you'll always be okay. So that kind of implies the whole reason why she says, you can never leave me, you know that, right? And the captain tells John, you know, after the hit and run, they went crazy because they could never find the girlfriend's body. He went crazy. And maybe that's why John's going crazy right now because he can't find Veronica's body. Is that why you're going crazy? You know, people see only what they want to see. Then we get a flashback of the captain driving into the woods behind the morgue so that he can avoid the CCTV. And he 
gets the body out through the tunnel, puts the body bag into his trunk, and as he's reversing out of the woods, because there's no like road in the woods, he hits the back of the car on a tree. So then when he arrives at the morgue, he hits the metal trash can with the back of his car. And he's like, ah, shit. And all of the detectives saw that. He was the one that turned off the electricity. He also, when he asked John for a cigarette, he never smoked it. We never saw him lit it. So we saw him later go to the bathroom, light it, put it in the trash can, and then in front of all the detectives saying, wasn't that John's cigarette? The wine glass, the text messages, that was all the captain. And the captain is telling him all of this while he's beating him up. Then the captain tells him exactly what John told Heather. Soon your body will go numb. Within eight hours, you will be paralyzed. Your heart and your lungs will cease and you'll be dead. Just like what you did to Veronica. But if you want to live, like you said, you have the antidote. Tell me where my girlfriend's body is buried. And John begs with his last breath, it's not Heather's fault. It was all me. When I die, please don't arrest Heather. She had nothing to do with any of this. And that's when the captain's like, is it true that Heather's pregnant with your kid? Yeah. How do you know? Did you go to the doctor with her? Probably not, because you can't get caught at the hospital. And then we get a flashback of the captain taking out the sister to eat, and she's showing the logo, and she lifts up her head, and it's Heather. Her real name is Hannah. She's my girlfriend's little sister. And it weren't for you, right now she'd probably just be a regular college girl. That day she told me it was Baron Pharmacy. I started looking into it and for the next couple of years, I mean, I was captain of my squad and I, I barely did anything. I was just at home trying to figure out how I was gonna get back at you guys, you and Veronica, murders. But what can I do? I can't sue you guys, I don't have evidence. You guys have all the money in the world. What can I possibly do? And then Heather found out. She found out that I was plotting revenge and she asked to be part of the plan. And I said, no, you're gonna get hurt. You need to move on with your life. You need, you've got a full life ahead of you. Go to college, do something with yourself. And she said, no, we're gonna get them back. And I said, what are we gonna do, huh? What are we gonna do? And she says, we'll kill them if we have to. And then we get a flashback to when he, before he went to the morgue, he asked for a glass of water at Heather's place. And she had put in some of the fluid in there. Oh my God. And the captain kicks him. And John knows that Heather, the love of his life, was the one who poisoned him. And she's not even Heather. And so then we see the captain digging and digging and digging and digging. And after he's done digging, he looks at John, who's like laying motionless on the ground in the woods. And he says, I died a long time ago too, when you killed my girlfriend. Let's not meet in hell too. But then John is not actually dead. He wakes up because someone had administered the antidote to him. And he's handcuffed, the police are there, and we see where the captain was digging is now Veronica's body. And the, the police are like, you sick fuck. you murdered your wife and then you stole her body so that we couldn't do an autopsy and then this? And then the other detectives are like, where's captain? I don't know, he drove away. I think he's getting food or maybe drunk, I don't know. And then she's like, well, he was right. Guess what I found? You know how he has needle marks on him? Ketamine, I found drugs. He's probably doing drugs and his wife probably threatened to leave him and so she killed it. he killed her. God, what a sick fuck. And they're like, rich people. And they're just doing some more digging and, and it seems like he's gonna go to jail for the rest of his life and no one's gonna believe a word he said. And Veronica is actually dead. She's actually dead. So he did kill Veronica. What? And now he's getting caught for it. And then we get a flashback to the, or we get a scene, the ending scene of the captain picking up Hannah and driving to a rural area. And he opens up the trunk because he had dug out his girlfriend's body. And the only thing left of her were some bones, but also he had gifted her a necklace for an anniversary and she wore it every single day. And the younger sister, she would always look at the necklace and like twirl it. And she just cried while she held it. And that was the end of The Vanished. 
It was so good. I mean, the whole time it leads you on to believe, okay, the twist is that Veronica's alive. Yeah. You know, it leads you on to that. It's the, the, the twist that she's alive. Like, you think that she's alive, but you also think there's more that's going to happen. Like, you think that she's going to somehow frame him for this, and then what's going to happen to Heather? Like, she's going to do it so smart because, you know, even in the flashbacks, you get this glimpse of just Veronica being, like, this insanely intelligent person who knows everything, you know? Yeah. So you just think that she has, like, this masterful plan. But then you have no idea that that the captain is involved. Like, you just think that the captain's, like, really smart. Like, the whole thing is, the ca the twist of the captain that I got was that everyone thinks that he's a drunk, but he's actually just a genius. Like, that's kind of the twist you get. You don't think that there's going to be another twist. Right, right, right. You just are like, oh, he's so much better than people think he is, you know? Like, yeah. he's actually really good, even though he looks like, yeah, I don't care. Oh. And Hannah's not pregnant. <laughs> But imagine the dedication to like sleep with the person yeah, who murdered that's a your. Lot. That's yeah, too much. that's too much. Like, love my sister, but that ain't happening. Yeah, that's... I'm not sleeping with my sister's murderer. But you know, when you're that young, like sometimes you just grow up with the. You gotta get it done. This is a good one. I would rate it a solid ten out of ten for. Ten out of ten. Okay, well. It's good. Your storytelling is really. I would say like an eight out of ten. So. I did tell it a little differently than the movie. The movie itself shows multiple parts where Veronica's alive in the morgue. What? Of John seeing her. So it kind of plays into the like, you only see what you want. Uh, so he's going crazy. But I also felt like that'd be a little weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I admitted those parts. Yeah, that's yeah. good. I like it. I like more of like the intrigue. I'm not really too into like the paranormal stuff. Even with the um, security guard, you actually see Veronica alive. Ah. Uh. So then it was kind of like weird, like the loose end didn't tie up for me perfectly. So I left that part out, but I would say it's really good in the sense of it's a really fun, easy watch. It's not necessarily the most, like the, the plot twist is so clean. Mm -hmm. Like there's not so many different moving parts that like if you look away for two seconds to like, I don't know, scratch your butt, you're like, what, what would I just miss? What happened? You know, yeah. it's like you you could go to the bathroom and then come back and still be like, I don't know what's exactly is going on, you know? Yeah. So it's a good movie. It's a very easy watch. Um, I don't think it's available anywhere. I watched it on like a Korean website that my mom told me to use and uh. gave me like her ID. She pays like $15 for it. I don't know. I even tried using VPNs to like other places, but it's just, I guess it's not that popular of a movie in Korea because in Korea, my mom didn't even know about this movie. Like I asked my mom, I was like, did you watch this movie? She's like, I've never heard of it. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was like a small box hit, so it's not available in a lot of places. But if you do end up getting the chance to watch it, probably would recommend it's good. Or you could just watch the Spanish version. It's probably better, honestly. Um, the original is always better than remakes. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's Baking a Mystery. Make sure to check out the links in the description to get that built bar, to get that booty bar. That's what I'm going to call it from now on, a booty bar. Because it's growing my booty. Fuel to the boots. And I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.